So welcome everyone. So um, another instance of the uh, Cardam seminar series. So today we're very happy to have Will Lamb. So I'll leave, I'll have my colleague Doris um, come and give an introduction to, um, to Will before he talks. Yes, okay. Welcome everyone. Um, uh, Dafal um, So Dr. Will Lamb is a senior lecturer in Celtic and Scottish studies at the University of Edinburgh. And I suppose a very distant colleague of mine uh, in terms of um, recent um, workshop proposals in terms of Celtic language technology. And um, he's originally from Baltimore, the United States, where he and he came to Edinburgh in 1996 to study in Master of Science in Celtic Studies. I'm very curious, actually, what a Master of Science in Celtic Studies is, because I have one as well, but it's a uh, Master of Arts. So, um, and as part of his research, he put he actually put together the first part of speech tagged corpus of Scottish Gaelic. And uh, he did a lot of work on other uh, language technology related uh, uh, tools later on. And he's currently the PI for a three year international digital humanities project funded by AHRC and IRC, which, is, which was already referred to in our informal chat there, um, decoding hidden heritage, which I believe is a project together with DCU. Uh, so it's Edinburgh DCU, and is there anyone else involved? Yeah, so it's um, it's Edinburgh, um, uh, Indiana University, uh, DCU, UCD, and also Durham University. Um, so at any rate, the, uh, the aim of this project uh, uh, is to make available millions of words of vernacular Gaelic folklore in text and audio, providing valuable data for next generation language and acoustic models. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure we're going to hear a little bit more about that in the next hour or so. So we lam ta falche ta falche warot agus lanar aik lanort. More on tank. Um, thanks very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to present this today. Delighted to be here. Here being. Um, a virtual here or an ever present here or whatever it is. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the situation with Scottish Gaelic language technology and NLP um, and uh, kind of you know generally speaking what where we are right now and where we hope to be in the future and the kinds of steps that we took to get to where we are and the steps that I think we need to take uh, as we move further down this road. For a minority language with less than 60,000 speakers, Scottish Gaelic has got, um, I think most of us would say, a kind of surprising level of provision in language technology. And uh, although I've been part of that, I'm certainly not the only person. And there have been some people um, who have worked very, very, very hard preparing, especially some of the data um, that uh, that's used to develop the tools. So we've got things like power speech taggers, lemmatizers, machine translation systems, or I should say system, because the only one that I know of is the one uh, that Google Translate did. Although I suppose we could include, um, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, Kevin Scannell's system, Intergaelic. Um, we've also got an orthographic normalizer, a text-to-speech system, a syntactic parser, a handwriting recognizer, and most recently, a speech-to-text system. So, I mean, quite a lot of stuff at different, levels of progress, I would say, or different levels of kind of competence. So in this talk, I'm going to outline uh, where we are with these tools and NLP research on Gaelic more generally. Um, as I said, look at um, where we need to go. So what's NLP? I mean, I think probably for most of us here, we know what it is, but just in case um, we've got folk from the digital humanities um, side of things, uh, which I would really include myself in. Um, natural language processing is often talked about as being the combination of linguistics and informatics. So kind of where linguistics and computer science meet, somewhere in the middle there. Um, up front, I should say that my own background is in Gaelic linguistics and ethnology, and I'm not a computer scientist. I can do a bit of coding, but that's about all right now. I'm actually uh, planning to do a master's degree another MSc in uh, speech and language processing at the University of Edinburgh over two years, starting next year, to, to really kind of get myself a little bit deeper into um, 
or I should say deeper under the hood of this stuff. And I see my role in Gallic NLP is um, at least uh, you know, up to this point as being an active facilitator and user. Um, I've done some work in Gallic morphology that's probably useful to this. Um, and it's found its way into some of the technologies that we're talking about here. So if you have any really deep questions about um, the NLP side of things, I might not be able to answer them, but I can certainly put, put you in touch with people who can. So why is NLP important for Gaelic? Well, the pandemic has catalyzed uh, changes that were really already afoot, I think we can agree. Um, a huge amount of our communication these days is technologically mediated, this talk being a case in point. And, um, you know, most of the time it's humans that are the addressees, but increasingly it's the computer who's the addressee. Um, I held a, a bit of a conversation with Siri last night as Siri was informing me about my brother and dad uh, texting me and reading out the texts and with me just, um, you know, dictating text back. So things like that are increasingly apparent in uh, on our modern society. So, um, you know, with the rise of things like computer, computational, computerized agents, it won't be, or conversational agents, it won't be long until computers are prompting us for responses, you know, increasingly like last night. Um, and, you know, currently this tech is overwhelmingly geared towards majority languages. Um, like English, French, German, Russian, Chinese, whatever. And the problem is, is that Gaelic is already very threatened. It's an endangered language. So it stands to reason that either you open opportunities for using it in the digital sphere, or English has an even bigger share of the linguistic real estate. Some of these tools, the things I'm going to be talking about, can make a really big difference to people. I mean, of course, when you're just talking about parse speech taggers or lemmatizers or whatever, I mean, these tools in and of themselves aren't going to make a difference. But when you kind of package them up into more complicated tools like uh, a speech recognition system or a text to speech system, then that, that's kind of where things start kind of chipping away at, um, you know, people are chipping into people's day to day experience. So I, I had a, um, a comment on our blog. Um, the Gallic Algorithmic Research Group blog um, a few months back, and I'll just read this to you. It was a parent of a child in Gallic medium uh, education, and she said, she was talking about the ASR project that we're doing. She said, this project looks like an amazingly useful and wonderful thing. She said, my son can write in English by dictating to his computer and then going back and editing for sense and errors, but currently has to dictate to a person, often me, if he wants to do the same in Gallic which limits his independence. And um, she says, you know, he can use word banks, he can use dictionaries, but it usually leads to his writing and Gaelic being much more stilted than if he could just dictate it himself. An option to dictate directly into Gaelic himself would utterly change his world and those of other Gaelic speakers with dyslexia. This combined with Katie, the Gaelic voice, so that's the text-to-speech system, to read back to him what he had written would be a game changer. And I think that's a really beautiful example of a real life use case for uh, NLP for Gaelic. And for me, this is the first branch of academia that I've worked in that's really got the, but the potential to improve people's lives. And that makes it, I think, especially meaningful. Of course, there's a lot of happening, there's a lot of stuff happening kind of online for Gaelic these days, um, you know, apart, apart from creating new speech domains for Scottish Gaelic or replacing ones currently dominated by English, NLP has got the potential to create new and better speakers of the language. The success of Gaelic Duolingo is a case in point, and that's shown the appetite, you know, that people have for this. There are over 600,000 people in Duolingo, or at least there were, you know, a few months ago. I expect it's even more than that now. And if we could find a way to harness the linguistic and cultural knowledge that exists inside a highly competent native speaker and teach it in a learner-specific fashion, I mean, that would transform the entire Gaelic language community, uh, especially the learning community. This vision, to a great extent, is currently science fiction, but it won't be forever. And we have an opportunity now to put Gaelic into or incrementally closer 
to that possibility or to further kind of walk away from it. And I'm all for walking towards it. Um, the Gallic community itself is pretty excited by this stuff. It's excited about the potential of NLP for the language and its future. And two weeks ago, we won the 2021 Innovation Award at the annual Gallic Awards Night uh, for our work on speech recognition. And the Gallic media are really keen to collaborate with us uh, to develop live subtitling systems and other things like chatbots. And there's no end of things that we could work on, really. The limiting factors are data, experience, and funding, of course. So the things I want to talk about today are um, what resources are available for developing Gallic NLP, what Gallic NLP applications currently exist, and as I said before, where do we go from here? So for those of you who aren't too familiar with this kind of brave new world of NLP, I'll just kind of break this down a little bit for you. Broadly speaking, there are two types of NLP. There's text-based NLP and there's audio-based NLP. So examples of text-based NLP are things like parse speech taggers, uh, syntactic parsers, so breaking you know, phrases or sentences down into their constituent parts, whether that's you know, by, on a word basis or on a phrase basis, and uh, things like machine translation. Again, that's a, you know, a text-based system, at least uh, if you're you know, typing things into a computer or into a phone. Audio-based systems are things like you know, speech synthesizers, so text-to-speech, or speech recognizers, speech-to-text. And if you have something like a virtual assistant, something like Siri or Alexa, it combines these two things, of course. And then if you're looking at um, you know, different types of NLP, you can break them down into rule-based NLP and statistical-based NLP. In the early days of NLP, all of the you know, the work that was done was more or less rule-based. Uh, this meant that if you wanted to assign parse speech tags to a sentence, then you had to tell the computer line by line how to do that. When Elaine Nigonoho, uh, who I'm sure some of you know, developed the first parse speech system for, for Irish, she took that approach. So it was mainly, a, or almost entirely a rule-based approach. Um, today, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the kind of revolution was somewhere around 2006. I mean, basically all NLP today, all big NLP work relies on huge amounts of data which are ingested into machine learning algorithms um, or systems. And uh, I mean, a good example of that is Google Translate. So Google didn't bring in any linguists um, to work on their Google Translate for Scottish Gaelic. Um, I mean, I, I was asked by Borscht and Gallic to approach them to see if they would do it. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, kind of what happened. But, you know, I was a linguist. Uh, I gave them a little bit of data and then went away, they went away and did it on their own. And, you know, they, they never got in touch again. They didn't need to because I, they had a huge amount of data. So um, everything is basically statistically based today. If we look at the resources that are available, or I should say the, the applications, the, um, you know, the programs that are available for Scottish Gaelic at the moment, um, in terms of text-based NLP, we've got a tokenizer, we've got a lamentizer, we've got a parse speech tagger, which is pretty good, a syntactic parser, syntactic parser, which is pretty good. We've got um, Google Translate for machine translation, and uh, Kevin Scannell system into Gaelic, and then we've got an orthographic normalization system too that I'll talk about um, towards the end of the talk. So what's tokenizing? Uh, it's really simple. So basically given a stream of text as an input, you return a list of tokens. So you break basically things down into punctuation and words. Um, they don't need to be words. I mean, there are different ways of breaking a sentence up. So if you look at the first example, my dogs are fat. What a weird sentence. But anyway, the output, um, but you could uh, do things a little bit differently if you had a sentence or, if, or you know, a clause like, so ha uh, is, is, mo is my, is dogs, ashen is there. So you could break that up like this. So um, allowing for the hyphen to be a token, or you could uh, kind of combine 
un with shen, the way that probably most people write it today anyway, as a token. So both of those are acceptable. It just depends on what you're hoping to do. So tokenizing is a really important kind of first step for a lot of um, NLP applications. Then you can move on to things like lemmatizing. So given a text input, um, you return the lexical root of each token. This can be really useful for many applications. When we were, um, I was working with Mark Sinclair on putting together the first word embedding model for Scottish Gaelic in 2015, we found that by lemmatizing the training corpus, uh, the model was a lot more effective for certain things. So when we, you know, asked it, um, you know, give us all the color words. Oh, we didn't say that. We just, you know, typed in do or typed in jedak or whatever. So typed in black or red or whatever, and then it would spit everything out. Um, it could recognize that or those semantic fields, if you like, much, much better if they were dealing with a lemmatized corpus rather than a non lemmatized one. So it's a, it's a way of, um, uh, of usefully losing data in some applications. Parse speech taggers. Um, so um, once you've got uh, you know, a clause or a whole document tokenized, then you can run it through a parse speech tagger. And that's um, where you, you know, given a text input, you return tokens that are morphologically classified. So to use um, you know, the, the clause, ha nakon voda aln. So the big dogs are here. Weird sentence, but anyway, um, it's useful for doing this kind of thing. You can see, so you've got the token here, you've got the tokens here, you've got the lemmas, the word roots here, and then you've got the tag. And then, you know, you can use, um, the algorithm can give you back the glosses as well, depending on what you're doing. The one that we developed or the one I developed with um, Loic Boisieu uh, a few years ago would do this. And anyway, so that can be really, really useful for, again, other kind of downstream applications. One of them is a syntactic parser. So this is, you know, given a textual input, uh, you get the syntactic function of each, each token. So here's that same sentence, here are the tags, and then these annotations refer to kind of what each of those words are doing functionally within that clause. And here you get, um, kind of a semi-typical tree, tree diagram uh, based upon that output. So, and we can move on to talk about things like machine translation. And of course, that's, you know, I mean, everybody's used to that probably nowadays. Um, you, you have, uh, you know, your input is a text in one language and then you get uh, an output in another language. Doing this with audio is also increasingly possible. Not for Gaelic yet, but hopefully someday. Talking about audio-based NLP, we've got things like uh, speech synthesis and speech recognition. Those are the two really big ones. So, um, you know, let's take a look, uh, having covered, you know, the different types of applications that you encounter in NLP, let's uh, look at uh, what res resources and tools are available for Gaelic specifically. And I'm happy to say that most of the stuff that we've talked about there, and actually a, a few other things too, are available uh, for Scottish Gaelic. When you're building these systems, you need data, lots and lots of data in most cases. Um, and fortunately, we've got a few really key components. One is a digital lexicon, and uh, the one that we've used is Mfahba BIC, which was developed by Will uh, Robertson and Michael Bauer. Michael um, has... Uh, it helped us with a heck of a lot of different projects. Um, very, very clever guy, um, a serious polyglot, but hugely committed to Scottish Gaelic. And he single-handedly basically typed in uh, Dwelly's dictionary of Gaelic. And then he didn't stop there. He started building his own dictionary of Vakvabek. Um, I think pretty much anybody who uses Gaelic online spends some time with this. I, I type stuff into it multiple times every single day. Then we've got things um, that fall under the category of digital corpora. So large bits of text, large collections of text for a specific purpose. That's what a corpus is. We've got annotated corpora. Uh, or I should say we have an annotated corpus. We've got one. Um, the uh, what does this stand for again? Arcosk, the annotated uh, reference corpus of Scottish Gaelic. We've got non-annotated corpora or corpuses, if you like, um, Corpus Nagalic, which is uh, a huge corpus that they did at the University of 
uh, Glasgow. They're still working on it. It's absolutely fantastic. I think they've got somewhere around 30 million words now. And they do plan to, um, to tag it at some point, and it'll be amazing uh, once they do that. We've got other non annotated uh, corpora like Island Voices. Uh, these are transcriptions of videos that are online, freely you know, available through co uh, Creative Commons, um, of stuff that was done mainly in Uist, but increasingly in places like Lewis. And then we've got uh, the fine work of Kevin Scano, the GD corpus, which he did as part of Ankurubadan. Um, and so that's about, I think, 5.5 million words of Gaelic that was um, uh, taken off, off the web using web crawlers. So to look at um, Anfakhla Bic, we can grab different things from Anfakhla Bic uh, for NLP applications. Um, so we get uh, rough information on uh, the geographical variation. This is provided by um, the different uses of the site, we can see, you know, more or less where the term is used. And I mean, you do have to take this with a slight, um, you know, grain of salt, but it still can be really useful sometimes. We've got um, also phonology, so you can see how things are pronounced. We've got morphology, uh, so it tells us, you know, the, the category of the words. And we've got information on sem semantics. So these are all super useful uh, for doing NLP applications. Um, now, Amphalkabic wasn't put together specifically for NLP. I, I have uh, no doubt that Michael Bauer and Will Robertson were thinking about the potential of doing it, you know, for, for that purpose. But, um, but they certainly didn't present it that way um, in the beginning anyway. Um, and it's not freely available. So we're, we're lucky to have a tire with uh, Michael Bauer through some different projects and he's made a lot of the data available to us on uh, for different projects. But as I say, it's not freely available. So in order to work with it, you kind of have to do a bit of data wrangling and reformatting and things like that. But um, the tokenizer, sorry, the lemmatizer that we developed um, relies to a pretty heavy extent on, um, on the work of Michael Bauer and Will Robertson there. <clears throat> so what has... Um, what has come out of Amphakabic? So you've got word forms, you've got a phonetic lexicon as well. And we've used uh, the word forms to develop, as I said, the lemmatizer. We've got, um, uh, you know, Michael himself has developed a spell, a spell checker. We can, um, you know, use the phonetic lexicon to do things like speech recognition and speech synthesis. Um, there's a really fine speech synth synthesizer that was developed called Katie. And then we can do a few other things like um, orthographic normalization um, using the word forms that they've got. Um, we can look at you know, the morphological information that Michael's got there and develop perhaps in the future something like a, a grammar checker, which would be really, really useful for Gaelic. Moving on to um, Arkosk. Um, so this is a corpus that uh, we developed um, on the basis of a corpus that I did for my PhD um, back in, you know, between 19, it's a bit scary, 1998 and 2002 or so. Um, it's an 84,000 word corpus that was marked up manually for part of speech. Um, I did the annotation my, myself first, uh, as I said, for my PhD, but then we got a team of people to work on it and reformat it um, using uh, different, um, tagging convention that was used actually for the Irish corpus that Elaine Nugonaha um, used, um, the tagging scheme that she used for, for her own work. Um, so that makes it just a little bit more useful when you're doing comparison to, you know, Irish and other European languages that use the same tag set. So now there are now two versions. There's a, a smaller one that uses 41 tags and then another one with the full tag set uh, 246 tags and then I did a mapping between those and the universal tag set um, which um, we've used in um, the linguistic analyzer that I did with uh, Lloyd Boisey which I'll talk about in a, in a few seconds. Um, so you can you can get Arcosk from GitHub and you can stick it into AntConc or any other con concordancer you want to use. Um, if you're interested in lexical searches, 
then probably Corpus Nigalic is going to be the best thing to use. But if you're interested in, you know, power speech tagging, um, inducing a power speech tagger or, or something else like that, then this is really useful training data. Some of the things that have come out of it, well, obviously, power speech tagger, syntactic parser, that was uh, developed by um, Colin um, Batchelor at the University of Oxford, and they also used bits of um, RCOSC for developing KT, the speech synthesizer. <clears throat> now, in terms of non-annotated corpora, um, as I mentioned, you've got the Krubadon corpus, uh, which is brilliant. Um, I mean, of course, some of that stuff is really messy, and you have to kind of just accept that when you're, when you're using it, but still, it's a really useful corpus. Um, the Island of Voices stuff, you've got about 350,000 words of completely vernacular colloquial Gaelic with mainly native speakers. So you've got the text and you've got the audio. It's brilliant. Um, it's what we used to begin, you know, working on speech recognition. They give us a real head start on that. You can download the raw texts from Corpus Nigalic, um, the ones that are out of copyright. And there's... Um, Another thing I'll talk about uh, just very briefly. So um, at the beginning, Doris mentioned that we got some money from the AHRC and the Irish Research Council to do some work with the UCD, DCU, and you know the other universities that I mentioned. Um, and we're taking items from the National Folklore Collection in Dublin, as well as um, at the University of Edinburgh as part of the School of Scottish Studies Archives. And we're using automatic handwriting recognition to, well, after digitizing them, using um, HTR, handwriting recognition, to you know, extract the text from these. And then we're going to be doing a lot of work on them in terms of analysis. But the, the brilliant thing is, in terms of the, the Scottish Gaelic stuff, is you've got about 7 million words, we think, of, um, again, highly vernacular speech data. I mean, these are stories and you know, short kind of um, memorates and things like that that were recorded from the 1950s through mainly the 1970s. So um, really good Gaelic speakers from the time when Gaelic was still very much a community language um, talking about really interesting things. So we've got all these transcriptions. Once we get them digitized and in digital form, then we can use them to train uh, the next generation of speech recognition systems. So the currently available NLP tools that we've got for Gaelic are things like, as I mentioned, machine translation, speech synthesis, lemmatization, POS tagging, parsing, and handwriting recognition, and also ASR. Um, so this gives you just a wee kind of screenshot here of Google Translate. If you've never used the Gaelic one, um, it's gotten a lot better than it was when they started. Um, they got in touch and, well, Borshna Gaelic asked me to get in touch with them in 2015 to see if they would do um, a Scottish Gaelic, you know, version of Google Translate. And as you know, you know, Google Translate essentially learns by ingesting you know, huge amounts of bilingual data that they find online. I sent them some data that I had and um, they had checked out things that they could find on the Internet. And um, they said they didn't think that uh, they'd be able to find enough to actually do the, the Scottish Gaelic version. But um, come 2016, they launched it. I mean, basically unbeknownst to me, it was amazing. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't too great when they started, but by 2018 or so, um, I think they improved the models that they were using to generate um, the tool and it got a heck of a lot better. Then again, uh, last year in 2001, we noticed some pretty big changes. And now it's not perfect, but it's a far cry from what it was and it's uh, extremely useful. The Gaelic Linguistic Analyzer, which is down here, is a tool that I developed with Loic Boisou um, and that packages the, um, the lemmatizer, the par speech tagger, and also the parser. And uh, go ahead and check that out. So just do a wee search for it um, online and you'll find it. Um, Intergalic is the tool that Kevin Scannell does, did, and uh, that's a pretty good tool going from Gaelic to Irish. And then there's a voice synthesizer that Sarah Prop did, which um, is probably, I mean, in, in terms of like the state of the art for English now, it's probably a little bit long in the tooth. It's, it's not as kind of convincing in terms of um, 
particularly its international qualities as uh, some of the ones that are coming out for English. But I mean, it's still brilliant, you know, for Scottish Gaelic, still completely usable and very, very good. So again, if you've never used it before, go check it out. You can, you know, go into their demo and type stuff in and you can, you can hear it uh, speaking back to you in Scottish Gaelic. Here's um, a screenshot of the Gaelic Linguistic Analyzer. Um, it was trained on about 95% of our cost and we held out 5% to evaluate it. Um, the website's fully bilingual, so you can check it out in Gaelic and in English. In terms of, you know, under the hood, it's uh, based on a Python server, server solution that relies on Flask um, and Gunicorn. Um, and um, yeah, you can, you can type phrases in here, or you can, you can also use a, a POST request. Uh, here's an example of the kind of thing that you can get back. So this is um, uh, a curl request with, um, you know, asking for, I don't know how you say that, is it Conlu, um, a Conlu output. So this uses, you know, basically where well, you get your, your tokens, you get the lemmas, you get the universal parse speech tags, you get the more specific parse speech tags that uh, we did, you get um, syntactic information and also, of course, the parsing. So it's a really nice format. How accurate is it? Well, um, when we did our first hacker in 2014, I think, uh, this is what we were getting back then. And bear, bear in mind that this was done using more or less the same data. Um, at that time, uh, now let's see, what do we use for that? Um, going right out of my head, what algorithm we used, but um, Loic's version um, used, is it CRF? I can't remember. I think it was, yeah, it was conditional random fields. Um, so um, just by using a different algorithm, we got better results. Um, so now we're getting in terms of the full tagging, uh, the full power speech tag set, uh, you've got uh, about 91% accuracy. And then for the simplified tag set, which actually does the job for most applications, you're looking at about 95%. So, I mean, pretty good. Um, and then if you're using universal power speech tags, that kind of smaller, I think it's like 11 or 12 tags, maybe even 10, then you'll get um, slightly higher. I think it's 96, 97%. So not quite as good as English, but I mean, not, not too far away. Um, in terms of the work that we've done for handwriting recognition, um, you know, the, the reason for doing this kind of work is just the, there's a huge amount of stuff at the School of Scottish Studies Archives and a few other places that are in paper form and they're handwritten and it's speech data. I mean, it's, you know, wonderful trans, transcriptions of wonderful data. So we wanted to get our hands on that desperately. And we got some money um, two or three years ago to pilot, I think it was, I don't know, maybe it's 2019, to do a pilot project where we took um, about, oh, about 3,000, pages and we digitized them and then trained um, transcribers um, to recognize the stuff. So we selected, yeah, 2,724 uh, uh, pages and we got an RA to manually transcribe about 40 hours of this stuff. Um, so that worked out to be about 118 um, manuscript pages. I, I, not 40 hours of, of audio, sorry. He, he worked for 40 hours. So that got, got us about 10,000 words or 118 manuscript pages. Then we used that initial kind of tranche of da data uh, to train an initial recognizer. And then we used that to transcribe about, I think, 200 pages or so. The RA corrected them. And by that point, we had a really good algorithm. And we found that um, basically by, by doing this, and it was a short project, I think it was only seven or eight months, but um, by training that tool, we were able to quadruple the output that we would have had without it. So that's quite, um, quite successful and quite impressive. And uh, the work that we're doing is part of the HR, HRC and um, IRC project, the um, Decoding Hidden Her Heritages, will build upon that initial pilot project. Um, so at the end of that project, on the main hand that transcribed um, those texts, we were getting um, a word error rate 
of about um, 14, oh, sorry, no, my mistake, 4.94, a character error rate of about 1.67. So, um, I mean, a pretty accurate model. Looking at other hands, so hands other than the primary hand that transcribed most of the data, we were getting actually a more modest um, word error rate of about you know 15 percent, character ec, uh, error rate of about five percent. But as we bring more hands into the data as part of the current project, then of course we'll see you know that those error rates go down substantially. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about the the sp speech recognition project, um, and that ran. It's still running, but um, the funded part of it um, was between September 2020 and July 2021. And the goals were to automatically transcribe Gallic narrative audio. So to be able to input a recording, a digitized recording of Gallic narrative taken from the School of Scottish Studies archives or somewhere else, um, you know, a, a more modern ethnographic project and to be able to automatically transcribe that material. Um, we also uh, tried to produce an orthographic normalization tool. We successfully did that. Um, it still got a lot of work to, to be done on it. But anyway, the, the point of doing that, and I'll talk about that again in a few minutes, was to enable the rapid inclusion of digitized texts to a training platform because so much of the stuff that we've got, uh, you know, these transcribed uh, uh, texts on paper from the 1950s, 60s, 70s, whatever. This stuff is all written in a slightly older form of orthography. So it's really important to kind of update its spelling uh, before you work on it. So that's the point of that tool. So to talk about the components of the ASR system, there are three main components. You've got an acoustic model, you've got a lexicon and a language model. So the lexicon is just really a, a list of words and their phonetic uh, representations. And we got that original information from Michael Bauer's database. Uh, then we extended it. And I'll talk about that in a second. But we, so we needed that. We needed a language model. And uh, what a language model does is, well, if you think about predictive text that basically works, uh, you know, it, it's, it exploits a language model. Um, this is a predictive model. Given, you know, a set of words, it'll tell you what the next most likely word is. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's the kind of thing like if you, you know, type in the United States of, then you'd expect your language model, if it was an English one, to be able to tell you that the next likely word is America. An acoustic model, uh, given uh, speech audio as an input, uh, it predicts the most likely phoneme sequence. So if an audio, if a speaker says an audio, you know, good morning, then it would break um, good morning down into g ooh, duh, et cetera. So each one of those sounds will be broken down into a phoneme. So in order to do this work, um, we need a bunch of different things. So we need textual data to form a language model, a lot of it. Um, we need a phonetic lexicon, as I said, to help kind of see the acoustic model. You know, if, if you don't have uh, a ton of transcribed text aligned with audio, then you kind of need to do other things to get uh, that acoustic model to work. And then, um, you know, once you do kind of have that audio in the transcriptions, as well as um, a grapheme to phoneme model, uh, if you can get that, then you can really start building that acoustic model. So one of the problems that we faced was that our text is full of junk, uh, at least stuff that we don't need um, to form an acoustic model. And I'm talking about things like punctuation, capitalization, uh, digits, and stuff like, you know, the speaker and time code. So in order to start working on this stuff, uh, we need to get rid of all that or reformat it. So we developed um, a text normalization tool. This was actually uh, Lucy Evans, who is the RA on the project. Um, Lucy is now, I'm very pleased to say, um, uh, formerly employed full-time. Uh, initially, it was with um, Quarit Technology Limited, who are our um, commercial partners on this, um, or indust industry partners, and they uh, got bought out basically at the same time that Lucy began by the, um, the London Stock Exchange Group. So Lu Lucy walked into a really good job after this project. Anyway, she did an amazing job. 
Um, so she created this tool uh, and it was able to do things like verbalizing digits. So 1860 or um, well, three feet, it, it would just kind of come up with, with that three feet, um, and get rid of all the extraneous stuff that we didn't need. So once we had that stuff, um, and because we had a reasonable amount of transcribed audio paired with the original uh, recordings, so the transcriptions paired with the recordings, um, courtesy of the School of Scottish Studies Archives and uh, Gordon Wells's fine work on um, uh, island voices and a few other things, we could use a technique called forced alignment to, uh, to get the kind of speech data that we need or get it into the right format. Um, and that's basically taking you know, a text and taking the waveforms and then combining them so that we know um, whereabouts you know, the, the words occur in that audio. So we, we can kind of basically time, uh, timestamp everything. And um, we use Quartz fantastic alignment systems. They were real pioneers in this technology and um, it did a really good job. Um, so this is fantastic for you know things like lesser resource languages that don't have tons and tons of this uh, this data and don't have tons of people to actually manually annotate it for you know uh, time code or whatever. Um, this is a way of very quickly kind of putting things into the right form. Um, so there was one little thing that we didn't have, and that was an acoustic model, right? It's kind of, you know, chicken and egg. In order to do the force alignment, you actually need an acoustic model in the first place. So what could we do? Well, what we did was we uh, did some phone set mapping. So we had this lexicon, this phonetic lexicon from Michael Bauer, and we developed a, a grapheme to phoneme model um, to use it. And uh, that kind of looked like this. So Michael Bauer had Gallic IPA that he developed, um, not that he developed, didn't develop the IPA, but he transcribed all these words using Gallic IPA. And what we did was we, we transformed them to standard IPA as a kind of a, a first layer. And then we put them into ARPABET, which, is, um, which would allow us to use an English acoustic model um, in the first place, which is very, very strange. Um, and uh, by doing that, we could run the Quart align, alignment system. And actually, it worked a treat. Uh, amazingly, despite losing all this information from the, uh, you know, the, the phonolog phonological information that you'd expect would be so important for Gallic, despite losing all that, the alignment system actually did a really good job. Um, so the G2 model, G2P, G2P model, again, um, converted pronunciation or the pronunciation lexicon, which was about 30,000 words um, into ARPABET. And we achieved a simple error rate of about 3.82. Um, so, um, so we had, again, that lexicon, we ran, we developed a model to basically recognize the patterns in that and then very quickly go from a Gallic word into ARPABET. Um, so we could do that for, you know, reliably for about, um, whatever, 90, about 96% of the words that we encountered. And from that point, we could do, you know, where we had a transcription and where we had the audio, we could suddenly, um, you know, get all the time code and provide that um, as automatic subtitles. And this was, you know, the first great output that we have from, from the project. We, um, we took some videos that Gordon Wells had done as part of the Island Voices project, and we gave them back to him with subtitles. And he banged them up there on Google, I uh, not on Google, on YouTube. And then to our astonishment, um, none of us thought this, but suddenly because they were subtitled in Gaelic, and Gaelic is included in Google Translate, then you could watch these in any language that Google Translate catered for. So you could watch them in English, you can watch them in Chinese, you could watch them in Arabic, whatever. It was amazing. And I think illustrated one of the real exciting things about this technology for you know, taking a language like Gaelic and extending it out to the rest of the world, making this material available to anybody. So, um, <laughs> Uh, 
So you can see how reliable that actually is. And the other thing that's wonderful about the subtitles is that as a language learner, and I remember this very, very well, um, I've gotten past that point, fortunately, but it, it was painful. You know, just th th that point where you kind of recognize some of the words, but not all of the words. But as soon as you've got it in this format where they're running by your screen and they're being highlighted, you know, every single word, you know, your, your, your brain can learn a lot faster that way. So it's a wonderful resource now. You know, all those videos that are now subtitled up on the internet, it's a wonderful resource for language learning. Um, so to talk a little bit more about, you know, what we did with the ASR system, because, you know, once we have that alignment system, then we can quickly go from transcriptions uh, and, you know, um, start developing training data. So our system takes a waveform as an input, then the acoustic model um, tries to work out what speech sounds are in that waveform. And it does that, you know, um, with all that training data that, that came before. And then it tries to match those sounds to the individual words using the lexicon. So just that standard lexicon that, that we've got. And the language model uh, works with that too. So, you know, if you say, then uh, you, the, you know, because of the language model, um, you expect it to know that the next word is probably a tour or a jace. And we're still very much in the prototype um, uh, you know, stage of this work, but we have um, made a lot of progress. And uh, I'll just give you uh, what I think is one of the best illustrations of where we are with this right now. Hopefully some of you understand a bit of Scottish Gaelic, you can follow this. So this is, um, um, you know, none of this was transcribed before we ran the algorithm over it. Um, this is somebody from South U.S. to very well Kent person, uh, Manini Kanuj, who is um, the chairperson of Borst and the Gaelic these days. And she, uh, for a long, long time, has run a community arts group um, named Keolis in South U.S., a very, very important group. <laughs> Fask is three fichet is jig, Blionadash. Hamakinjach Gare will me do none a beck hugs this merging is a Nimatar Shosherut Haka, number there, Agus Jol or Sahuami, the Matarut. Ah, Hanor and me gonna be do none tangle, Homa, Sava, there, on the Nimatar Imatartoi. The Ruka me, Harawanach. Vic de Vlionachan as Joey Hockey. Get a half far akin in the verse in your fast sewers as a new good. Gero da hocker with the meown, having Mitchell Clinton goo itches his cocker. Agus a va chinpeo, commanded of va delicate hockown, va hulishian hockown, Agus va beher hoshinkly, a hokruye can a noun. But through the Sajola Hakanya, Mahin is my viewer, Agus Mavrahel, Agus Nilafos Mahas Mavahel, Hai Asin Ugudur, call the parent in Mahel, a Sinishosh root of a command, pause at Sanopans, the Banish Vicar Casamahi, the Higat Gahi, Agus Bagat Kuchkin Kinshiro. Okay, so um, that gives you just a wee demonstration. And, uh, you know, I have to admit, it's one of the best uh, transcribed videos that we have. But I mean, there you're getting, I think, I mean, around about 95% accuracy. So that would certainly be at the top end of what the system's capable of doing. Um, in terms of, you know, our evaluation, um, we've got, uh, you know, 103.5 hours of audio training data. We've got uh, about 8.5 million words of text, and that's given us a word error rate of 26.3, so an accuracy of about 73.7. Of course, that's the mean accuracy that's right across the sample, and some of the, um, the stuff we're trying to recognize is actually very, very difficult to recognize. Um, the, the acoustic conditions are suboptimal. Um, the, uh, the dialects might be a little bit less familiar to the system, and um, people, you know, might be using a lot of English words or they might be talking very fast, whatever it might be. So, you know, we're actually setting the bar very, very high in terms of 
um, the way that we're evaluating the system. But in any case, <clears throat> you can see where we are right now in this graph. Um, this is kind of, you know, looking at um, English's, uh, sorry, languages like English, you know, uh, how much data uh, you need to get to certain word error rates. So we're around about here with 100 hours. And as I understand it, um, to get to the next order of accuracy, you need to double, oh, sorry, it's a logarithmic scale. So you need to um, basically, you know, it's, it's the next, how do I say this? It'd be like the next log of, um, of the training data. So you need to go from, you know, to, to double your, your, your accuracy, you need to increase your, your training data by a factor of 10. That's what I was trying to say. So you need to go from 100 to 1,000 to get to, you know, from uh, basically like, you know, whatever, you know, 25 to uh, down to about 12.5 uh, or whatever percent error, um, error rate. And then to get down to anywhere near human parity, you're really looking at about 10,000 hours or so. We recently received this large, you know, AHRC, IRC grant um, to recognize and analyze the full tail archive at School of Scottish Studies archives, as I mentioned. And we reckon that there's about 7 million words there. That would give us about a thousand hours of audio, I think, which would on its own bring us down to about 15% uh, word error rate. We, we expect to be working with other partners, though, too. We're in conversations with MG Alapa. We expect to bring the BBC into these conversations uh, this month, or I should say next month um, in December. And uh, if these, so these you know, conversations go as planned, then we'll be working with them to, um, to develop a, a, a subtitling system that could be used um, for live broadcast. They've got thousands of hours of training data. The problem though, is that none of that is actually transcribed. So that's the real benefit of using that data from the School of Scottish Studies archives. But if we can employ people to do some of the corrections, so run, you know, the uh, say, you know, radio programs or TV programs through the ASR system, provide, you know, a first pass transcription, and then somebody corrects it and sends it back to us, then iteratively, um, iteratively bit by bit, the system will get better. And eventually we'll start creeping up, um, you know, towards the 1000 hour mark and then onwards. Uh, so it's an exciting time to be doing this stuff. By 2000, 2024, we hope to be about here, which would give us a system that, I mean, I think for, you know, clean, uh, modern audio, the stuff that you expect, you know, on broadcast would get us probably, I hope, a little bit closer to about here, maybe about a 7% word error rate. We'll see. So this is the prototype web service that we've developed on the back of this stuff. Um, you can find it um, if you look at, um, I'm trying to remember where this was actually um, publicized. If you look at our Twitter page <clears throat> or my Twitter page, you'll, you'll be able to find this. So just get in touch if you want to have a play with it. It's not brilliant. Um, the, the, the acoustic model is actually quite small because it's basically uploaded on your computer. Um, but once it is, then you can play with it and there are no kind of you know, data protection issues or anything. You could just click on this button and then talk into it and I'll hopefully recognize at least um, most of what you, you say. Um, <clears throat> we've also started developing, or we did develop this prototype orthographic normalization system. As I said, you know, so much of the training data, the textual data is in older forms of spelling. So this will hopefully, once it's kind of fully, you know, just in the, in the best state it can be after this next bit of funding, um, you know, we'll be able to run through all that old, you know, 19th century data and put it into modern Gaelic and build much bigger language models as a result. Um, you can find this, again, um, that's on the same website, so you can play around with it. Um, <clears throat> so that's quite exciting. So where do we go from here? Well, I'll just kind of bring this to a, a close. We're coming up on the hour mark. Um, Elon Musk famously said that he wanted to die on Mars, just not on impact. Um, I don't have anything as... Uh, kind of poetic to say or clever to say, but you know, before I kick it, I'd really like to speak to a computer that was more fluent in Gaelic than me. And I think that's a possibility. But I think, you know, to leave that kind of uh, slight pipe dream, artificial or generalized artificial intelligence idea to one side, 
I think all of our work right now should be motivated by one single factor, and that is how do we, one single concern, that's how do we strengthen the Gaelic speaking community now as it exists and in the future. And Gaelic's an endangered language, so we need to deal with that existential threat, or computers might be the only one speaking it in the future. So some of the midterm goals that uh, I've set, you know, our team and the people that I work with are things like, um, as you can imagine, providing more accurate ASR, providing live Gaelic subtitles, hopefully in the next three years, which will um, you do a lot of great things for the Gaelic language. But one of them, you know, once we have these, these models really fine tuned, we can do things like, you know, approach Duolingo or maybe some other educational um, provider and find ways of enabling coaching of Gaelic phonology. So teaching people to speak it better from day one. Um, no computer is going to get tired of correcting your mistakes in a language. People do. So that's a great advantage of learning from a computer. We're also going to begin work on natural language generation. Um, I found out a couple of weeks ago that we got a small grant to start doing this. Um, I'm a co i on a project with Edinburgh and Napier working to develop the first Gaelic chatbots to engage with online media, and then hopefully we'll expand um, doing some other things. And again, uh, MG Alipa, which is the commissioning service for Gaelic TV and very closely aligned with the BBC, they're very, very keen to do chatbots and conversational agents and stuff. And this is really just the beginning of that. Um, so it'd be great in the next five years to have these initial chatbots and then some basic voice assistance moving towards the kinds of things that you can do with Siri or Alexa or whatever. And uh, so what things do we need? Well, I mean, the sine qua non is speech data. We need a national corpus of Gaelic conversation. We need something like, I mean, if we had 5,000 hours of spoken Gaelic, um, which is not unimaginable, if, if we could get people to, you know, phone up a service or to use, you know, anytime people were speaking in Gaelic, if this was incentivized, perhaps they would connect through a web service that recorded their conversations and transcribed them. Um, if we had that kind of, you know, that kind of data set would be amazing. If we got people with Bluetooth headphones and their smartphones to record themselves speaking Gaelic with each other in their homes, that would be amazing. So if we had you know, 5,000 hours, that would give us about 25 to 30 million words of data. And that would take us right up pretty close to that 10,000 hour mark. Um, so that would, that would really make a difference. Um, we need more annotated data. We need better, you know, part of speech tigers. We need name entity recognizers. I don't think that one exists right now for Gaelic. We need bigger lexicons. We need larger Gaelic word nets. So all these things would be amazing, really useful. We need more robust NLP pipelines. I mean, they're, they're kind of fragmented. Not all of them are available publicly right now. It would be amazing to have a Gaelic version of the Spacey Library. Why not? It's just It just takes, you know, interested people to get together and do it. Um, we need people, you know, we need more people with Gaelic skills and NLP skills. We're the two that combined. So it'd be great to have scholarships funded by Borshna Gaelic, funded by uh, the Scottish Funding Council, funded by the government to bring people into this line of work because uh, the jobs will exist. Um, they, you know, there will be um, a reason for these people to have these skills. <clears throat> And under, underlining all this really uh, is better knowledge exchange partnerships between uh, community groups, between the government, between um, the universities, and between commercial groups as well, businesses like Duolingo or whoever. If you want to find out more information on the stuff that is happening, you can have a look at uh, the blog for the Gaelic Algorithmic Research Group. You can look at uh, my Twitter, Twitter feed, so I'm William Uwan. Um, you can look at Kevin Scannell's Twitter, Michael Bowers, and uh, you can also look at the Celtic Language Technology Workshops. Um, there have been three of them so far. Uh, Doris mentioned them before. Um, so good places to look for stuff on this. Here are, uh, here's a list of our funders, Moran Tank, Jara Hain, the Bunyan show. Many, many thanks to them. And I'll just leave you with this. Am Ian Dawkins, can the horse and the shahulid in you? Moran Tank, give Uluk.
Hey. Thank you so much, Will. That's, that's an interesting talk. I, I've got lots of questions. I, I don't know if there's any questions from the floor first, if anyone wants to raise their hand or... Or maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, it, it's really interesting looking at all the technology, but I, I mean, one thing that maybe I, I become is, is a bit of a, how do you see this actually working kind of language revitalization efforts? So, you know, how do we actually use this technology to encourage say, more people to learn and speak Gaelic and to continue to teach, teach their children Gaelic? Yeah. Um, well, I think there are different answers to that. I mean, you know, the, the kind of the low hanging fruit that I think of is if we get people to, to, instead of, you know, speaking to Siri or Alexa or whatever through the medium of English, if we get them to do it in Gaelic, then they're using Gaelic more often during the day. So we're, we're, you know, introducing a new speech domain, basically. So that's one thing. Of course, that's not, you know, people speaking to each other, though. And I think that's that's the real important bit of this. How do you keep a, a community together? Well, <clears throat> I mean, one of the, again, a, a low hanging fruit for that, I think is to encourage people to, you know, engage with, um, with Gaelic media a bit more. I think if we had, um, uh, you know, subtitling um, in Gaelic, then people might come to, you know, Gaelic TV more often, uh, particularly if they're a little bit weaker on the language and that could, that could help them, um, you know, bring them into the fold a little bit. In terms of getting them to be, you know, more competent Gaelic speakers, more involved Gaelic speakers, um, you know, if they're not using Gaelic on a day-to-day -day basis already, if they're, you know, um, passive bilinguals, let's say, or language learners, then giving, uh, you know, improving things like Duolingo so that people can get help actually pr producing Gaelic. So practicing, you know, different phrases, getting feedback on what's right and wrong in the phrases. If we had a, you know, a system that could do, um, you know, a, a grammatical correction to let people know, well, hey, you know, you said um, instead of saying, um, I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, the old woman, you said, so you didn't lenite the sea. And that's a word that needs that lenition. And here are the reasons why. If that could be presented in a you know really quick fashion, people could start feeling a lot more um, confident. <clears throat> pardon me, about their language production. But all these things, I think, work together. You know, it's it's a case where the sum is greater than the or the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Every time that you do one of these things, and people you know see that things are happening for Gaelic, it's not a language that's stuck in the past. It's exciting. Then I think that bit by bit people who might not be using it as much as they could do, start to do that. Kids start looking at the Gaelic that they're learning in the schools as being actually um, a viable way of communicating uh, and an interesting way of communicating. And when they leave school, they, uh, they speak to Siri in Gaelic. They, they think, well, actually, why don't I speak to my friends in Gaelic? You know those who speak Gaelic. So I don't think there's any single answer. I think it's lots of different things working together. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It's a lot of things. You know, you have to make the language useful for people and something that fits into their lives. And you know, using translation of you know also things like software, video games. You know, being yeah. younger generation. You know, having that making it easier to translate these things so that you know people can use it in the language. I think is very helpful as well. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, the more that we advance on um, the structured data, from perhaps, and what I mean by that is, you know, things like semantic nets or whatever, the more that we can quickly, you know, uh, kind of translate, say, you know, a, a bunch of text that we use in a video game into Gaelic, if that can be done really quickly and to no cost of the, the game developers, then perhaps they'd be willing to, to provide that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it's the same thing for like Amazon and Google or whatever. You know, if you come to them and say, look, I mean, we've done all the hard work for you, mm -hmm. then maybe they'd be willing to come to the table. I'm not, I'm not convinced that they will, but I'm hoping that, uh, that they will. I mean, Google is, you know, it's so far is the only one that's actually done anything when it comes to mm -hmm. Gaelic, but maybe bit by bit. Okay, great. Are there some other questions? Or? Well, I guess the other, the other thing, the other aspect I was also thinking during your talk was that, 
you know, what we see happening in the mainstream of NLP, particularly in, in English and other major languages, is we use of, of more and more data and models like BERT and T5 and stuff come along and are just trained on, you know, mind boggling amounts of data. And, you know, there's sort of, I guess the, the blood weaver's question is, is how would Scottish Gaelic ever catch up with this or ever keep up with, you know, what's happening, what we see in, in for English and other, you know, major languages? I think that's a great question, John, and, and it's something I think about a lot. The, the thing is, we never will. We've got a, a choice of basically being left in uh, the non-technological room or going out of the room on the co coattails of the, the majority languages. But we don't really know what's going to happen in the future, right? And I think as these models, particularly multi-language models, get smarter, then we might find that, you know, at some point in the future, for a really smart AI system going between English and Gaelic is no big deal. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, what, what do we need to do to be in the place, to be there for, for that when it happens? And, and I think it's, it's to, to keep working away at the stuff that we're doing. If we stop this, then it'll, never, it'll definitely never happen. But, you know, we'll never be able to keep up with these large language models. I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, for a start, it's not universities that are, develop, that are developing them anymore. Mm. I mean, most of the, the large scale word model work or language model work is being done commercially, mm -hmm. right? Because none of the universities have, have yeah. the data that Google's got, that Apple's got, that Amazon's got or whoever. You'd never be able to compete with that. So what I'm saying is like, even for English, universities will never be able to compete with what the big, companies can do mm -hmm. but they can still do a lot and in Gaelic we can still do a lot if we had I don't know let's just say we had 50 million words which is tiny you know for a language model if you're dealing with English but let's say we had 50 50 million words of really good conversational Gaelic I think that we could do a tremendous amount with that mm -hmm. we could definitely create a, a Gaelic chatbot I mean there's no doubt about that and for specific domains you know if we think about think really carefully about what we want to do with Gaelic then perhaps we can do those things we might, might not be able to do everything that you can do for English but we might be able to do an awful lot within particular domains. I think Michal do you want to come in here or? <laughs> yeah I just wanted to say that uh... I noticed in your talk, Will, that you, you were not talking so much about translation, which is a pleasant surprise for me, because when I compare uh, your situation to the language technology situation in the Irish language, then in the Irish language, there's a lot of work which is motivated by the need to produce translations, right? Mostly going from the majority language into the minority language. Uh, whereas in your case, it seems that that motivation is not there so much. I mean, you did mention some translation apps, but mostly you were talking about things that are actually happening in the language itself, like uh, speech synthesis and things like that. So, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I just I just wanted to sort of uh, announce that I noticed that, and I, I think it's it's healthy if you have. Uh, language technology in the language, which is oriented primarily towards serving people who speak the language for kind of doing things in the language, as opposed to just uh, translating things quickly out of the language or translating things into the language, which people can just as well read in the original anyway. So uh, I'm always very skeptical about sort of uh, translation technology from minority, from majority languages into minority ones. And I'm, I mean, it's obviously because uh, Scottish Gaelic doesn't have the same amount of official recognition that Irish does. And that's, yeah. that's what motivates uh, so much uh, of the translation. Yeah, but, uh, yeah that's right. Um, or, or, or is it maybe the case that there is a lot of translation technology work going on as well, except not on your desk, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think there's a lot of work going on for Scottish Gaelic translation. I mean, you know, once Google put out Google Translate, I think everybody basically decided that that was kind of good enough for most things that they needed. Um, I've, I've not heard of anybody interested in doing 
translation between Gaelic and majority languages. There is interest in doing translation between Gaelic and Irish and vice versa, though. Um, for the project that we're working on right now, you know, um, with DCU and UCD, we're going to be using Kevin Scannell's Enter Gaelic to go between Scottish Gaelic and Irish. It'd be great to come in the other direction, too. Um, and th there's quite a specific reason for that that I can think of, and that's that the two cultures are very similar in many ways. The, the two languages are very similar. And if you look at the ethological materials, the folklore, which is, you know, another thing we could we could do a whole number of presentations about that, you know, just the exciting developments in online, you know, pre representations of folklore. Um, there's, there's a huge amount of, of work that could be done there academically, but also there's a huge amount of community interest in this stuff. So Topran Dolchish is the uh, audio uh, portal for Scottish Gaelic folklore and Scots folklore. Yeah, and she's by, that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, she's by a huge number of people, you know, just in the communities. If we had a way of accessing if, if a Gaelic speaker had a way of accessing even just the text that was in Irish in Scottish Gaelic that would be fantastic and then they you know just if you're just sitting at home and you're just interested like all right I'm just I'm looking at this tale and it's a really cool tale and I just want to see what's out there in other parts of Scotland oh that's great oh so there's lots of different versions of this what about in Irish how similar or different are they in Irish oh wow there's a ton of stuff in Irish and I can look at it now in Scottish Gaelic, that would be brilliant. Um, so that's the only place that I can see where machine translation would be really useful. It's between Scottish Gaelic and Irish, not so much between Gaelic and these other languages. So, but that's my own personal take on it. Yeah, that's a win-win situation because the languages are so similar that machine translation is pretty easy, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Uh, is there any other questions? Okay, in which case I'd like to thank our speaker. It's a great talk, um, uh, really interesting, um, and we'll obviously develop it on YouTube um, afterwards. Um, so we won't have a seminar in December because it's Christmas, um, and we'll be back at the end of um, January of the next seminar, um, and that will be announced um, through the usual mailing lists um, in the next few weeks.